Um, and before you were a filmmaker, mm. you were a carpenter yes. for many years. And, and I know that you have compared filmmaking to mm. carpentry. And before we get on to talk about the politics mm. of the film, I wonder if we could just talk about some of the... I don't say the nuts stuff. and bolts because I'm not uh -huh. a carpenter, uh -huh. but some of the construction. Um, it, am I right in thinking that it's unusual for a documentary mm. not to have a voiceover? A narrator. We, we yeah. made a, a very conscious decision in both of our films, Paper Stories of Undocumented Youth and 14, to let people speak for themselves. You know, it's really problematic to me, like, who's going to be the voice of truth? And I always want to see who is speaking. So it means that there's a bit more reading um, involved, but people then can read at their own pace, and hopefully we gave enough time. Um, we tried to make it so that you could read it through if you wanted to three times over all the reading. But um, we didn't want to make a judgment about whose voice was more truthy. Mm -hmm. um, and that everyone, including a narrator, has a perspective. And so we have many narrators in the film. Mm. And, and, but one thing that was a constant in the film that, that really struck me, and struck me even more seeing it on the large screen, this is a very emotional film, mm -hmm. um, is the music yes. and your use of music. And I wondered if you'd say a bit about that. Well, we were so lucky. Um, I'm from Portland, and there's a great music scene, an art scene, and we know we're friends with both uh, Edna, who d did the, one of the last songs, and um, Joaquin and Salvador. So we knew these folks, and we said, we're making this film. I told them what the film was about, and I asked them if they would be willing to do original music. And all of this music is original for this film. Um, the, the last song during the backwards montage, we were recording in a little studio not far from my house. And I, as I was listening to her hum it and sing it, I had my hand on my head. And I was like, my, my work partner said, are you OK? And I said, I just pictured the end of the movie. So when you're going backwards in time, I'm like, that's it. And Salvador and Joaquin, um, father and son, singing together is beautiful. And then, you know, you don't know the whole story of their relationship, but their whole relationship is in how they sing together, and it's, it's, really, it's really gorgeous. Mm. So, and then the spirituals, I went, I met these two remarkable women um, at a conference, and they studied Civil War music. And I went to them, and I said, could you be part of this? So I went to the University of Northern Colorado and we, we recorded them there. And we didn't, we have uh, vocal recordings too, but we would, it would have been a different kind of use. So we just ended up using the piano. Mm -hmm. All these people gave so much to this film. Yeah, oh, it was extraordinarily mm -hmm. uh, effective. Mm -hmm. So what, what, what are the, the greatest challenges to making a, a documentary like this oh. that you faced, sort of either in production or post-production? I mean, you sort of, you have an idea, then you say it out loud, and then you have to do it. That's part of the problem. <laughs> uh, you can't do anything. I mean, be careful what you ask for. And, um, and so I said, I really want to do something about birthright citizenship, and we wanted to make it tangible. You know, it's hard to make constitutional issue tangible. So I wanted to do it with the families. Mm. So of course I gave myself this big project of there must be a Dred, Dred Scott descendant. So I found Lynn and we talked on the phone. We made a time to meet. I flew to St. Louis. We had a nine hour meeting where she took me to all of these significant sites around St. Louis. And she still didn't say yes yet. We had to have more. To, and I was like, I will absolutely represent you, what you want to say. And she's, we're really close now. We're really good friends. Um, but, you know, you don't know. And, you know, people um, are wary of how their words, how their representation is going to be used. Yeah. We looked for a descendant of Wong Kim Ark for about a year and a half. And at the same time that I was looking for a descendant, um, there were other folks looking for a descendant um, to honor, because they were going to be having in San Francisco on 
Korematsu Day a celebration of Asian American heroes, and they, would they wanted to have a descendant of all of these different Asian American heroes. So we, we like had an ad hoc committee of finding a Wong Kim Ark <laughs> descendant, and, we, and it, wasn't gonna be, it wasn't gonna be Sandra. Sandra is the one in the family, she has uh, older brothers. She's like, they know more, they should do it, but in the end, sh she did it. They weren't available, they decided against it, and I love taking you through her discovery. Yeah. That's not fake, that's real. When she goes to Sacramento Street, that was the first time. When she goes to the archives, that wasn't staged, that was the first time she saw those documents. Mm. So, ch yes, challenges, I mean, it's, 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 you know, it's mostly the um, meeting my own expectations is one of the biggest challenges. We had a whole, we had the movie Rough Cut and we had a whole section on the Civil War and I didn't know who was gonna tell that story. And Brian Stevenson, if any of you know of him, that was one of the biggest gets we got in this film that he agreed to do that. He is brilliant. He, the, less than an hour that we shot of him, I could just put on a screen and it would be a movie. It does, wouldn't need any editing. So that he said yes to us was wonderful. Okay, But it was a long time in, put, so if you say it took a year of research and so on. Does it, mm. it, it, so t tell me a bit about, and we can move on to the politi mm -hmm. politics a bit now. Tell me a bit about why you decided in, what, did it start in 2012 then, you're deciding well, to do the movie? Well, it was really 2010, I'm sure many of you have followed um, the DREAM Act, and our, our previous film was about undocumented youth, and in 2010, um, there was a vote on the DREAM Act, and the House passed it, and the Senate failed to pass it by five votes. Five votes were Democratic votes, I just wanna throw that out there. Um, and we are, were and are very close with many DREAMers, many undocumented youth, and people were devastated. We, I tried to prepare myself, but I was and continued to be devastated. And we had, you know, a lot of, we went to a lot of meetings. It was like, what are people going to do now? And sort of, it, and then I asked myself, what am I going to do next? And in 2011, right after, just weeks after that vote, um, they introduced the Birthright Citizenship Act again. And I, th with, at the new Congress, and I thought, I really need to do a film about birthright citizenship. Because it's something that we don't talk about. It's been a, a much bigger issue lately. I mean, I, would, I set up a Google alert early on in production, and it was one or two articles a week. And now it is sometimes dozens in a day. Mm. Um, it is, I think, about shifting the conversation from legalizing folks to questioning uh, the citizenship of people who already have citizenship. And so we can get much more into that whenever, whenever you're ready. <laughs> well, I, I wondered what the, what, the, what the shift is from when it was first screened in 2014 mm -hmm. to now, and it seems even more, mm -hmm. more relevant now, if that, if that can be true. And well, what, What's your thinking now you see mm -hmm. it um, four years later? Well, if I could get up and walk around, which is much more my style, but I was staying in this seat because it's, I'm trying to be nice to these camera people. Now you have to cut that out. Um, it's, if we have the converse, if we introduce birthright citizenship as a concept that we have to defend, we're making, the, we're bringing this idea that's way over here to the right, and then talking about legalizing Vanessa's mother, Antonia, it's way over here, it's lost. L legalizing dreamers is way over here. Now we're defending the rights that we have now. I am, a I, I have birthright citizenship because of what the Wong family did and the Scott family did and what the Lopez family is continuing to do. If you're a citizen and you're not naturalized, you have birthright citizenship. We all have benefited from what they did. Mm. Um, we're sh the sh by the shift of the conversation, we're introducing vocabulary that's dangerous. We're making things seem acceptable that aren't acceptable. 
Um, every month, 66,000 uh, Latinas and Latinos come of age um, and to vote, are able to vote. I think this kind of talk about who is not included affects their sort of civic self-esteem so they don't register, so they don't vote, and I think that is the, I think that is the point. Yeah. Make them feel like they don't count so they don't exercise the right to vote. Um, you know, we have a census coming up, and I think that we're gonna hear a lot more about these issues as the census comes up in terms of who gets to be counted. In, by law, it's everyone, regardless of citizenship. We are rep everyone is represented in Congress, regardless of citizenship. I think that is going to be put in question. Um, so one of the things I wondered when um, Rosario Lopez stands up and she's wearing that wonderful t-shirt yeah. and saying undocumented mm -hmm. and unafraid and mm -hmm. unashamed, um, I wondered whether she would do that today yeah. if, if she hadn't. For, I, mean, I wonder whether the climate has shifted so much today that it's harder to do that. Mm -hmm. Rosario um, is one of the bravest people I have ever met. And she is not going anywhere. I mean, she, no. She, Rosario would, would continue to speak out, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, so would Vanessa, and so would Antonia, so. Can you tell us a bit about, do you know what they're doing yes, now? Yes, well, I'm, I, I, I don't know how many documentary films I have in me, mostly because I, have very significant relationships with the people who are in them and I protect, I want to protect them, quote unquote, for the rest of my life and know them. And they are, you know, they've given me and us such a gift by being in the film. Yeah. Um, so Vanessa's in high school, she's uh, quite gifted. I think she would add to, you know, uh, marine biologists and all those other photography. I think she would be interested in being an immigration attorney and so is, so is her mother. Mm. Um, I hope that Rosario goes to law school. She has worked um, as a translator, medical translator. She is a recipient of DACA. She's not going to stop. She's just not going to stop and neither is her family. Of course, the stress of all of this is is intense on all of these families. Um, you know, the Mar March 5th deadline was just a few days ago and um, I can't, I mean, I don't think we can even calculate how stressful this is on entire communities, extended com families. Um, I mean, it's affecting literally millions of people in our country. Yeah, so um, my, my Daughter is 17 and mm -hmm. uh, one of her close friends has to answer the door and her parents, when there's a knock on the door, and her parents go to the back door with bags mm -hmm. that they have packed in case they need to run out the back and that's a, that's a recent yeah. shift in, um, in what they feel is necessary in the current political climate. Um, so, and, and she's such an affecting child, Vanessa. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, oh Vanessa she's Lopez, extraordinary. So. I mean, when we had, you know, her, her full name, her full real name is in the movie. And I talked to Rosario, I talked to Vanessa, I said, I want you to talk to all of your people, I want you to think about this. And she was like, we're all in. And it's not like, it's okay, it's like, we want to. And Rosario has told me that she thinks that it has helped Vanessa's anxiety and depression to participate, to be part of it, to, to do this. I wondered about the impact of the film on them. Yes. Uh, you know, several years now since it was first screened, so, but it's been a positive one. It's been a positive one. Right. Um, I think that you know, when we first made Papers and it came out in 2009, there were attorneys who were telling undocumented young people, don't go public whatever you do, and they were, finally, they were like, no, we're going to do this. And I was there on, in March of 2010 in Chicago when they first did this public coming out of the shadows event, mm -hmm. and, well, uh, like two hours before the event, I walked through the square, and there were canine units, horses, and giant ice vans, and I thought, what is about to happen? I went to the hotel, got the camera, came back, and it had transformed into bicycle police, 
totally mellow, the ice vans were gone, someone made a good decision. Mm -hmm. But they did not know what would happen. I think that is part of all of this. When they said, my name is, and I'm undocumented, they didn't know what was gonna happen. But now, you know, when we made that film, uh, five people went sort of public, without last names, without telling where they live, without, yeah. um, now there are 800,000 public folks, very understandably anxious now, but there are 800,000 people who people know and who people care about, and that, and they call it coming out. Mm. And I appreciate yes, I that. that. Yeah. I appreciate that as a, a, a lesbian, as a queer activist, and they, they're, they, they get it. I mean, when, when I was starting to interview people for that movie, they kept saying, and this, and this, and that, and I'm gay. I'm like, oh my God, another one? And it was like they, the most early out folks, as undocumented, also identified as queer. And it didn't surprise me at all. They knew the power of coming out. So this movement, and they know it, mm. has been built on this whole idea of coming out of the closet. And the, look what they look what they got. Mm. They they they, I think, it wasn't charity that Barack, that our president Barack Obama gave them DACA. It was because they sat in in his reelection offices and said, "We demand this," and they got it. Mm. Mm. Um, is it unfair to say? I, 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 I think it is unfair, but I'd still like to hear you uh -huh. <laughs> respond to it, to say that um, uh, there's such emotional force to having uh, the words of children mm -hmm. about not treating people badly mm -hmm. and um, about the, the fact that there shouldn't be boundaries, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. we should all be treated the mm -hmm. same. Um, has that substituted for argument at the, towards the end of the film? Have you allowed mm -hmm. emotion to substitute for argument? Or, or does the juxtaposing of mm -hmm. their family's position mm -hmm. with after the, the um, Dred Scott case and then the Wong Kim, Kim Art case, does that do the work? It's interesting because um, people consume, take in films in really different ways depending on who they are. Mm. Some people, well, they'll notice that Vanessa cried, but they'll be like, oh yeah, now I get it about how the Wong Kim art case. So, you know, I think a film should do, should be intellectual food and uh, emotional food at the same time. I mean, one of our uh, big editing uh, challenges was how to cut the crying scene. Mm. And also how to film it. We were very close. Was, was that the scene with the mother and daughter? The mother and daughter. Head. That was an extraordinary scene. Well, and ha do you cut them off in the middle? I mean, mm. one part is um, do, I mean, we were so close. We were this close to them. I had to like smother myself to not cry out loud. And the cameraman, my colleague Roland, I could just hear him breathing really heavily. I'm like, oh man, that better not be picking up on their mics. <laughs> but, um, so we had to keep it together during filming and then during editing, how much is too much? Mm. And we talked about it a lot, we, but we needed a cut point that didn't feel artificial because Rosario was about to say something and she finished her thought, then we cut it. Some people have a hard time with that, but it was like real. So where does your mind go during that? To me, I go to, they are thinking about their, the parents, their own lives, what will happen, other people they know have been deported. I mean, it's sort of a pause in the film, like what would you do if that was what you were thinking about? Mm. It's interesting that Vanessa isn't crying about her own mom, who's mm. undocumented. I think she's not worried about her own mom. She's more worried about her grandmother and her grandfather. So, did I answer your question? Argument. I think one argument is why would you break up families that if you don't need to? Why would you do that? That's an argument. Mm -hmm. um, I think we don't, you know, when the news talks about undocumented folks, they use the 
you know, terms like illegal alien and you think of Martians. And they show the same B-roll of people coming over a wall in the middle of the night. So it looks criminal, it looks sneaky. You don't see people sitting at the dinner table and saying why they did it. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, think, I think having some emotion is, is okay. It's hard, to film, it's hard to do. It's hard to film it. It's hard to, yeah. Well, so the juxtaposition of, of some of those domestic humanizing, mm -hmm. if you like, mm -hmm. scenes with then the um, crassness and callousness of the tweets yes. was very effective. Um, well, and I, I hoped it would be, and we, we made it uh, an audio decision, some of the film students will notice this, of having absolutely no sound under those. Um, so it just does stand out really starkly. And I brought, I mean, I, I don't think you need to hear more, but that kind of conversation continues of, um, today. Today, yeah. absolutely. Okay. Um, yeah, boy, I could go in so many directions right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, That's what, why you're called a moderator, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy for you to go in all sorts of different directions. Um, but one thing I do want to um, hear more about is the uh, personal impetus mm -hmm. um, from, from you and your family's mm -hmm. story that, and how that... So tell me about that and how that affected your decision to make the film and, and how you made the film. So when I was growing up, we had, you know, I was really interested in family history and I hope all of you are because things, you find out some interesting stories. Um, our sort of family pioneer story was the story of my grandparents leaving the Ukraine and uh, coming to Mexico, um, where it took seven years to get to the United States. Um, my dad actually is here tonight, and uh, he was one. He was born on that trip. He was born on that journey. They left the Ukraine in 1928, when you could still barely get out. They were uh, poor people. They somehow scraped together money. They were four kids and two parents came to Mexico, lived, worked in Mexico. He was born in Mexico. The plan all along was to come legally mm -hmm. into the United States. My grandfather, who I knew, who lived a long time, so I could hear these stories out of his mouth, um, went to the border um, and hired a lawyer, an American lawyer, and gave him all the money they saved, and they made a plan, and you were gonna come back and get the papers and go, immigrate into the United States. That was the dream from the beginning. So he went home, he got the family, he got everybody together, and they went, and the lawyer was gone, and the papers were gone, and the money was gone, and this is after seven years of getting ready. So they did, they did, I knew you haven't heard this story, <laughs> no, so I we say, <laughs> and, oh. so they, and, and, and little Al, little Wojciech, was four years old. So they did what they needed to do, which I think that's what immigrant families do. They do what they need to do. They, my grandfather hired um, coyotes to get them across the border in the middle of the night in 1935. And he, this is five little kids and two adults. And then my grandfather, and this makes sense to me because I knew him, went to immigration and turned himself in because he was sure that he could just explain the whole thing. So he, he paid the money to get across and then he went to go have a talk and they arrested him, of course. Mm -hmm. And um, so the family, we have actually a photograph of, of my grandmother with all the little kids around her and my dad in her lap um, under house arrest for a month. And at the end of that, and trying to find out what happened, they were ordered deported. But like many immigrant families, they didn't leave. And because of that, and well, I should tell you the rest of the story because I told the, the um, students that I was gonna swear on camera, so now I have to. Um, um, in the 50s, so they, they, they stayed in the United States and in the 50s, they looked up everyone's files who was from Russia or the Ukraine. Um, 
thinking that obviously these people are going to be communist. Um, so this entire family is contacted by immigration. They had never left. They continued to live and work in, in, in that, that point in uh, East Los Angeles. And everyone, so they were given uh, notices, hearing notices. So every individual had to go and deal with their own case on their own. And my dad, who was, were you 19 at the time? 19 years old, said, I've got this. I can go do my own thing. I don't need a lawyer. I'm just going to go talk to him. And so the hearings officer, and they were alone, asked him all these questions, trying to catch him in a lie. And when were you living here? When were you working there? When were you doing this? There, his mother and little sister had been killed in a car accident in the, in the 40s ask him questions about that, and, and at some point he said, ah, sh and the hearings officer turned off the tape recorder and said, don't, you know, disrespect me, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, turned it back on, kept going, but found, in the official findings, because of that, found that he was a person of bad moral character and it was recommended that he be ordered, deported to the country of his birth, Mexico. So he doesn't know anyone in Mexico. He's 19 years old. He's just graduated from high school. They also accused him of not being loyal to the United States because on his 18th birthday, he didn't register for the draft. So he was going to be deported. They could have picked him up at any moment and dropped him off in Tijuana without anything. And he went to um, army recruiting and said, here's, I need to go to, I need to be inducted now, I need to go to boot camp now, and this is why. And they took him. And um, sometimes I say to people, do you know what is the difference between my dad and a dreamer? Nothing. Mm. Nothing. Um, at that time, you could, if you could get yourself into the military, you could fix your status. So his commanding officer wrote a letter that said, Albert Joseph Galiski is a person of good moral character, and so then that set the stage for him being able to fix his status. But everyone in his family had to go and, and do that. In the making of papers, my aunt um, showed me her naturalization papers. And this is actually a difficult thing to talk about, because I say there's nothing different between a dreamer and my dad. But on her papers, it says that she is married to a citizen, that she has a citizen daughter. And on these official papers from the United States, it says she is a person of the white race. It says it. It is, we know, we know that there's white privilege. We know about the history of racism in this country, but it is really a gut punch yeah. to see it and to know, absolutely know, that our family has benefited from that. And I think it is my obligation to say it, to acknowledge it. Um, you know, when you, yeah. So it's, it's my, it's not easy though, it's, 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 ter it's absolutely terrible. But if you look at American history, we have to look at what, what really happens. Mm. Well, um, it's uh, <laughs> just hearing about it is incredibly moving. I, can't, I, I want to see the documentary about your family that you could mm. so easily mm. do because it's that's ready? also Ready? Ready for that? <laughs> um, uh, so, yeah, and it's take me a while to process. Mm -hmm. You know, that's uh, I didn't know that all of that lay. Mm -hmm. So, oh, so I didn't even answer it. your question. So, of course, immigration has always been fascinating to me. It's this whole question of who is we, mm -hmm. and that's the best question ever. I mean, that is interesting. That happens in every community. That happens in every civil rights discussion. That is what we're talking about. It happens in middle school. It happens in, in academic departments. Mm -hmm. Who is we? And um, I am very interested in making the concept of we 
broad, and there are some people who are interested in making it very narrow. And I think our obligation and our challenge today is to, even in this time when, when we're being made to feel more and more frightened of each other, to expand our concept of who is we. Mm. Right on, yeah. <laughs> 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 What would your advice be for the young student activist, um, maybe the young student filmmaker activist, mm -hmm. who wants precisely to do that? Um, well, you probably have to have a side hustle if you want to make documentary films. Um, I do, and it makes me feel very free. Um, I, Everyone who I know who makes documentaries has, does something else. So they are making commercials, and they're like, I hate making those commercials, but I do it. Um, I do a different thing. I build houses. It's, I, it is really similar, um, dif different tools. Um, but you, you do it because you can't not do it. Mm -hmm. And um, I think probably any uh, committed activist or artist will tell you that's why they do it, because they can't not. And um, I was telling you uh, backstage about some, some of my, um, my college friends are here tonight. And we, ha we, we were like so changing the world. And you know what we did do? We changed ourselves. We changed our community. We took ourselves a little bit too seriously. We had a group called the Student Hunger Action Group, which the acronym is SHAG. I mean, how seriously were we taking ourselves? <laughs> um, the, uh, my friend Steve wanted to have a group called uh, Save Students Against Virtually Everything. And so anyway, have fun and, and do this work and you'll meet and fall in love with the most extraordinary people. Um, it's, you know, making, and honestly, making documentary films, I am not gonna retire. I'm gonna do this until I I'm just crawling along because I get to talk to people, I get to ask questions, I get to find out what they're passionate about. It, well, it doesn't get any better than that. I am so holding myself back not asking you questions about, about citizenship in ancient Greece, so you consider yourself lucky. Well, <laughs> it's a wo wonderful moment to uh, end on, and your film is, um, amongst other things, about the um, Ordin about ordinary people mm -hmm. being courageous mm -hmm. and um, it's a wonderful thing to take away with us. Thank you so much Angela. Thank you for having thank me. You. Thank you. Thank you all.